Good morning. Well, Norfolk is known for its very large churches and I'm currently at one of the largest of them all. I'm at St Peter and St Paul in Saul, which is right smack in the middle of nowhere. There's no real village here or anything, but there's this ginormous building uh, stuck in the middle of the countryside. I'm going to take you on a little tour of the inside. So we're approaching the church now from the west end of the tower and as we come towards it, this is amazing door with lots of shields over it. There was once images above the doorway, now lost on either side. But what we still have are these two uh, glorious sensing angels on either side of the door, which were sensing that central image. There they are in their feathered pyjamas uh, on either side of the spandrels of the door. And above the door, a whole row of coat of arms of the people who uh, paid for this work, amongst others. Uh, other shields including the instruments of the Passion, etc. So let's go in, inside and see what this church is like. I'm here with my son Simeon, who's just going to open the door for us. Uh, doesn't want to be on the video, but um, he's still going to open the door. There we go. And in we go. Okay, so we enter underneath the West Tower and the first thing we see ahead of us is the 15th century font with its spectacular cover. We'll go around and have a look at that in a second. But I just want to show you the inside of this extraordinary church, right? So just at the west end next to the font, looking east towards the chancel, it is enormous. You can hear the echo, I imagine, from my voice. Now this church was completed by about 1440 and the work of construction seems to have taken about 30 or 40 years and was a collective effort um, primarily by the rich merchant families of uh, the parish. We'll see some of those in brass in a minute. But I'm just going to turn around. You get a lovely vista while I do so. I'm just going to turn around and show you the West End and the font. So here is the font. Typical Norfolk Seven Sacraments font with a vast cover which is suspended from a crane attached to a west gallery underneath the tower itself. Okay, next to the um, both porches are little newel stairs. And we're just going up the newel stairs next to the north porch. Just taking you up nearly there. And we emerge here into a parvis, a little chamber above the porch. Well, I say a little chamber, it's really a very large chamber. And extraordinarily, it's vaulted. This stunning vault. It's all been recolored, which uh, adds to it. And right in the centre, the centre boss of the Coronation of the Virgin. Got angels with musical instruments. It's a green man of some sort there. It begs the question what this room was for. There is a piscina to wash the sacred vessels at mass and a credence shelf. So we can assume there is an altar up here underneath this window. But it's a stunning light chamber. If I turn around this way, Simeon, can you just uh, close the door for me so we can see the back of the door? It's got its original 15th century door and this lovely feature. It can be locked from the outside and by this bar it can be locked from the inside as well. Which really does beg the question what that was for. And it's very strange. 
Okay, so this is the North Parvis over the North Porch. Oh, it's still got its original 15th century pament floor as well. So you really are entering the 15th century when you come into this chamber. It is really very wonderful. Let's have a one look last look at that wonderful vault. And the coronation of the Virgin in the middle. Now this church was constructed by the collective efforts of the parishioners here, all many of whom were wealthy merchants or landowners, and their brasses, or the matrices of their brasses, are all the way down the centre aisle. You can see them here, just passing over them, big perbet marble slabs with either brasses or the remains of brasses in them. The brass of a priest, another brass of a priest, a former chalice brass here. And among those who presumably contributed are this couple here. Just turn around so you can see them from the top. These figures. For a civilian, a man and a woman. And the inscription tells us, Higgshas at here lies Galfridus Berlin. Here lies Geoffrey Berlin. And Geoffrey Berlin, who was a wealthy Norfolk merchant, is the great grandfather of Anne Boleyn, Queen Anne Boleyn, the wife, the second wife of King Henry VIII. Little did he know when his brass was laid here in the building, he presumably helped construct that his great granddaughter would, in some respects, result in the English Reformation. So the church, as was fairly common in the Middle Ages, was divided up amongst the wealthiest families, with the south transept here being the chapel of the big family. Again, the south transept would make a church in its own right. It's absolutely enormous. Big perpendicular windows filling this space with lots of light. And there were altars all the way along this wall against the rude screen. A medieval altar platform survives here, would have been an altar in this position here, and then coming into the south transept, um, as is indicated by the piscina in the wall, to wash the vessels, there would have been an altar here in this position too, which was the, the family chapel of the big family. And one of their brasses survives, it's quite an extraordinary thing too, it's just down here in the south nave aisle where it's being positioned. But everywhere you look here, there's more indents for brasses. Moving along. And here is the brass of John Big. It's a shroud brass showing him dressed in his winding sheet. There we go, with an inscription in English below it. So it's John Big. There's no date on this brass. I think it's probably from the 1430s or 1440s, about the time this building was completed. It's now in the South Isle, but it was almost certainly in the South Transept originally. So evidence of post-Reformation use here. So this is rather fun. You've got the 15th century pulpit, wine glass pulpit, and it's been made part of a three-decker pulpit. There's, in the 17th century, it says the clerk's desk, the incumbents, and then the pulpit itself. And the pulpit still has lots of its original medieval colour on it and has a 17th century tester above. Yeah, well, let's carry on at this level from where the tester of the pulpit is. And you've got the chancel arch appearing here. And you'll notice there are two corbels next to it, which presumably supported the rude beam on which the great rude cross stood. And above it is the original 15th century tester, still with a lot of its paintwork, like a canopy of honour that went over the rude. 
And then if we pan around, we've got fabulous 15th century roofs all the way through here. The nave ceiling has an awful lot of its original paintwork on it too, painted in a sort of blood red, a, a sort of earth red uh, colour. And the sacred monogram, the name of Jesus repeated, and M. Arthur Maria Regina, Mary the Queen, for the Mother of God. And then coming down again, and we're looking at the north transept. And the north transept was the chapel of the Rus or the Ross family. Just moving in front of the reed screen here. Looking into that north transept. Let's have a look up for a moment before we go in. The 15th century ceiling. And again, there are more chapels here. The altars, another medieval altar platform we're just going up onto. To be an altar here. And where that fancy vase is, there's another piscina. Shame that there is another altar here. And there are a number of brasses here. Um, there's a rather interesting indent. It's a sort of per bit marble coffin lid with the indent of a priest. And then there is a brass here, which is curious in itself, to um, Thomas R Roos or, or Rouse or Rose. Um, with effigies of him and his wife and then figures of their children as part of the same plate. They all stood on a bracket. That's rather fun. And then next to them is the brass of John Fountain. Well, his has gone, but two of the brasses of three of his wives survive. So uh, John Fountain was there amongst his three wives with prayer scrolls rising from them. So lots of really excellent brasses to the people who constructed this extraordinary uh, building from the early 15th century. The dado of the medieval screen survives with eight painted images of saints, um, including the two original doors, which have images of the, the doctors of the church. You can see St. Jerome is labeled there. St. Augustine, St. Ambrose of Milan. So you enter the chancel through those doors with the doctors on them. A vast chancel again. Bits of medieval glass at the top of the east window. A orders of angels window. It's difficult for you to see on film. But if I head up towards the high altar, And they're going to turn us around. Very simple 18th century communion rails. We've got the piscina and the sedilia is just the sill of the window lowered for the clergy to sit on. And we turn to look west and it's got a full set of 15th century choir stalls and we've got to beg the question, why does a parish church need a set of choir stalls like this? There they are. It's a full set on the north and on the south. And these have tip-up seats, Missouri cords, 
which were carved with a variety of human heads and animals and foliage. And the hand rests also have rather nice carved figures on them too. All the way along both sides. And a lot of these large Nor um, Norfolk churches have full sets of choir stalls like this, which can't have been used for their, as they were intended. Of course, they would have accommodated the clergy during the offices, maybe prominent lay people as well. But there would, wouldn't have been a robed choir of any description here. The clerical establishment here would have consisted of the the parson and probably um, some of the clergy of the chantries and the guilds here, but still it wouldn't have required a full set of stalls like this. And there's to a certain degree a, a large element of we've got this space and we need to fill it. So let's move down now into the nave in front of the reed screen and have one last look west because I'm running out of battery rather quickly. One last look west into the nave with the font with its towering cover at St. Peter and St. Paul's in Saul in Norfolk. And lastly, because I can't resist doing this, and I've still got just a little bit of battery left, it's flashing at me at the moment. So I've got a matter of seconds and I might end up being cut off. Um, but I'm just stood now next to the brass of Geoffrey Boleyn, Anne Boleyn's great grandfather. And I'm gonna pan round to the east so you can see the dado of the medieval rood screen looking east towards the high altar in the chancel. Just imagine what this place would have been like in the 15th century with an altar here, an altar there, altars in the north and in the south transept. A place ablaze with colour, there's bits of medieval glass surviving but very little, but originally the windows would have been filled with wonderful blue and red tones and yellow tones of, uh, of 15th century glass. This would have been a place that was alive in the 15th century. All those altars, all those images, all the trappings of late medieval popular religion. This would have been a place that was very much at the center of the community of which it was a part and was worthy of the investment of all its principal inhabitants. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this very brief tour of St. Peter and St. Paul at Saul in Norfolk. It really is a most extraordinary and very special building. And if you find your way to Norfolk, please do go and visit. Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now.